Today's welcome to the um, meeting, a joint event between the Public Record Office in Northern Ireland and the Antrim and Down branch of the Western Front Association. And tonight's presentation is Finding Officers for Kitchener's Army by Ian Montgomery, formerly a, a former colleague of mine in Prony. Um, and uh, Ian has worked in many other places, including Belfast City Council, um, we also Historical Foundation and currently Columbia. Right? Um, so well, we look, it'll be good to hear from Ian. But a couple of housekeeping notes before I introduce Tom Thorpe to introduce Ian. Um, and they are, we've all been muted on entry, and that's so that we can hear the speaker. Um, Q&A will be at the end. So please put any messages in the chat function. I will come to you at the end of the presentation. And um, finally, just to let you know, we are recording this presentation, so you can choose to keep your camera on or off. Um, um, but that's your ch this choice is yours. So I'm now going to pass you over to Tom, um, as secretary of the of the um, East uh, of the Antrim and Down Western Front Association. Thank you. Good evening, all. Just a couple of parish notices. Um, just to say that we've got uh, Porrick Travers talking on Colonel Arthur Lynch at our next meeting on the 11th of October. Lynch is a really interesting guy. He fought with the Boers on the Boer side during the uh, Boer War, the early 20th century, then became a colonel in the British Army during the First World War. So quite an interesting talk there. And then on the 8th of November, we have Anne Robinson talking about uh, women doctors in the Great War. All those in all that information I'll post on the chat. Well, without further ado, I'll pass over to our, our, our very um, eminent chairman, um, Ian, who's going to talk about officers in the, in the 10th Royal Irish Rifles. Ian, over to you. Right. Thank you, Tom. I will try and do the um, share screen thing. So let me share if that's working, Tom. Right. Okay. I think that's working. Okay. Um, right. Well, thank you very much. Um, customary at these occasions to the speaker to thank the uh, the Antrim and Down branch of the Western Front Association for the kind, kind invitation to give the talk. But as I am the chairman, that was my idea to give the talk. Um, that's probably superfluous. So at least you know who to blame for this rather self indulgent event. This talk is. Um, it's basically a case study which is put together on one battalion of 36 Ulster Division. Battalion is 10th Battalion Royal Irish Rifles, the South Belfast Volunteers, uh, which formed part of 107th Belfast Brigade. The point is, I'm looking at the junior officers of the battalion and where they came from. That is generally the ones that come in as lieutenants, second lieutenants, occasionally as captains. Um, and I'm looking at the period from the creation of the battalion in September 1914 down to the Battle of the Somme. Um, so it's a very localised study and the justification for the rather high-fluting title is it maybe will show some light generally on how officers were being found for the new armies of 1914. It's a fairly unfinished project, despite of the fact that I seem to have been working on it for years. Um, and when putting this talk together, I became even more aware of various things which still have to be done. And so any conclusions which I managed to come to will be tentative, to say the least. Right. So part of the purpose of the talk is as well as looking where where these officers came from is also to look at some criticism of the brigade and the officers from some of their contemporaries. Major General Oliver, Oliver Nugent, who took over command of 36th Division in September 1915, complained not long after that that 107th Brigade, the Belfast Brigade, had no discipline and was not fit for service. He also stated that the officers are awful. And he blamed for this the commander of the brigade, George Couchman, who he described as a weak man and to the fact that commissions had been granted to what he called men of the wrong class. Some of these criticisms were echoed by Frank Crozier, who a fairly well-known figure, um, cashiered pre-war army officer who joined the UVF 1913, 
who becomes second man, later commander of 9th Battalion, West West Belfast Volunteers, later Brigadier General, um, and a writer of a number of fairly controversial books after the war. Uh, according to Crozier, looking at the, of course, the brigade as a whole, it had been necessary to obtain other blood from the officer class in England in order to set up a better standard among our officers. This, he said, is because middle-class officers could not command the respect of men from their own community because their actions are too similar and their private history is too well known among officers themselves and their rank and file. Although he does admit that the number of officers who were, in his view, duds, which he reckoned was about one in three, was more or less the same in the end among the local and the imported officers. So we're also going to try and establish in this how many of the officers that got down for this period from the creation of the battalion down to the song were local? Is there any evidence of a, if a scheme to replace the Irish officers with English officers? And is there any evidence of the Irish officers not performing well? Um, and it's interesting actually just to note in passing that the best known image of the battalion uh, that we have uh, in, in Beadle's painting of the attack on the 1st of July focuses, the focus of the painting is on an English public school boy, Frank Thornley, who was an officer with 11th Royal Irish Rifles. Um, as I say, Thornley was from an English public school. He does have connections to the north of Ireland and with pre-war unionism and through family members. But it has left an impression, I think, consciously or subconsciously of this being a group of Irish men or Ulster men being led by an Englishman, which I think is highly misleading, as well as come to say, because the majority of officers, certainly in the Belfast battalions um, on the 1st of July, are from the north of Ireland. So that's just a passing thought to, to bear in mind. The reason that I picked 10th Royal Irish Rifles is we have a contemporary or near contemporary account of formation of the battalion. Um, this comes from an officer with the battalion, uh, Captain Wycliffe McCready. Before the war, McCready had been an ophthalmic surgeon in Belfast. He was educated at Trinity, in Dublin and Queens in Belfast. And while well in Belfast, he'd been an officer in the Queens um, Officer Training Corps. He joined the battalion quite early on, was involved in the selection of the officers, and he also left a memoir, a quite short memoir, detailing the first few months of the battalion, which is not as far as a war being used by historians very much, though it has been in Prony for quite a long period. Um, so that's the reason in tenth for doing tenth initially was that we do have this account of which gives some insight into the thinking in which by which officers were selected. The other sources briefly uh, would be familiar if anybody has done this type of research. The officer files are not online. It's one of the last big collections of records sorry, for this period, which is not yet online anywhere. They're still in queue. Um, they are useful up to a point. They're not a complete set. There are gaps in them. There are a few missing for various reasons, particularly for officers stayed in the army after 1921. And there's not as much information sometimes as you would expect on the file. And you can't really use them always to get the full career of an officer to work out all the units he may have served with. Um, but they should give you, at least in most cases, the actual appointment details, the details uh, the officers gave when they were appointed to a commission. Other things were used um, are things like the... Um, Gazettes, uh, the army lists, um, which lists all the officers monthly for every unit. Again, they are problematical. They're not always up to date for the month in which they're supposed to be published. And they give very basic details for officers. And as I say, the other things which people will be familiar with, like um, medal cards and, and the London uh, Gazettes. Uh, I've also used some genealogical sources which are available for this period, particularly the 1911 census of Ireland, um, which can be useful. They're worth bearing in mind because it's 1911, um, it's three or four years before the formation of the unit. 
I know some of these guys are quite young. You will find these guys still in their family homes and possibly not much information about them. And particularly useful for this type of exercise has been the local newspapers. They quite often give pen portraits of people, particularly officers, if they become casualties, especially. So again, if, you, if you've done any research, you'd be familiar. If you look at the local newspapers, particularly after the Battle of the Somme or any other big engagement, you will be pages like this with lists of casualties and these little accounts background on the officers. So um, I'm not going to say a lot about the 36th Division. This is not a history of the division that's been done elsewhere in great detail. Um, just to say the context of the raising of division was the major expansion of the British Army at the start of the war. Kitchener famously asked for 100,000 volunteers on the 7th of August, a few days after the war started. That increases considerably over the next few months. With the result of the British Army, which at the start of the war had a total, including the, the territorial re reserve uh, and the imperial forces of about 700,000, expanded over 4 million, if you uh, count the, for the Dominion, Canadian Australian forces, by the end of the war, which is a huge increase. It is initially done by through volunteering, though after early 1916 in Great Britain, you have conscription. Um, this expansion led to a great drain on resources of all sorts. Um, everything was in short supply initially, uniforms, weapons, all the rest of it. Also in short supply are officers, particularly experienced officers. There was about 25,000 officers in total um, when the regular army before the war, of which just over 10,000, nearly 11,000 are in the regular army. By 1918, there's about 200,000 officers. The pre-war officers did form largely a fairly exclusive class drawn from the upper middle class and the upper classes landed gentry, usually recruited through the public schools. Only about less than 4% actually are recruited through the ranks. It was a very rare that anybody actually managed to get promoted um, from, from the ranks and those that did were extremely able uh, and extremely determined. Um, also, you generally had to have a private income to be an officer uh, in the army before the war. You generally couldn't keep up the lifestyle expected of an army officer on army pay. Um, this has to change during the war. In the initial phases in the war, the idea, among certainly among some people in the regular army, is they could continue to recruit from the same class. So they're looking to bring in public school boys, they're looking to bring in retired officers in the Indian Army officers areas like this, people who'd be in officer training courses and had proficiency certificates. But it has fairly quickly to broaden out beyond that. Um, and this is particularly the case with some of the volunteer units, particularly the so called PALS battalions, which are being um, raised in various localities where it's where you're going, particularly in urban areas, you're going down to the commercial classes, uh, foremans, chief, chief clerks. Um, and often the people who are raising these units are given discretion to actually appoint the officers. Uh, and this is essentially as we see what is happening with the Ulster Division and with the other Irish Division to a certain extent as, as well. So it is broadening out the social basis um, of the officer class. Though there's still a great deal of resistance for bringing anybody from what we would consider to be lower middle class or working class in, into the officer uh, cadre. Ireland, again, as far as no one ended up supplying three volunteer divisions, 10, 16 and 36. 10 was recruited fairly uh, immediately at the start of the war. 16 and 36 take longer. The idea that 16 would be based on the Irish National Volunteers, sometimes known as Redmond's Volunteers and 36 to be based on the Ulster Volunteer Force, Carson's Volunteers. It's not exactly how it um, works out. There's quite a lot of research on the actual uh, composition of both of these units. Now, they're not exclusively based from, from pre-war volunteers, but these organisations do form a major uh, part in their recruitment. So briefly, 
wanted to say something about the UVF. Again, this is not a talk about the UVF. That's been covered elsewhere. Um, and there's not a very good recent scholarship uh, on the UVF. But essentially, the UVF was formed in January 1913 uh, to give some muscle to the Unionist, Ulster Unionist campaign uh, against the Home Rule Bill. There had been training um, among organisations such as the Orange Order and the Unionist Clubs in the North before that. But the, the UVF brought all these forces together into one organisation. At its peak, it was claiming a membership of 90,000 men. It should be said that figure has been contested. The Royal Irish Constabulary, who were monitoring things, put the figure a bit less than that. They have some weapons after April 1914, probably about 40,000 rifles of various ages and calibres. This gives them a certain degree of credibility as, as a military force. The leadership was to be provided by retired British Army officers and NCOs or local men who had some experience with militia units, officer training corps or similar organisations. UVF organisation was based on locality. Uh, based on squads of 12 men. We are basically based around a town and under a street. Sections of 12 men grouped together into half companies and companies. Um, a company was about 100 men, uh, which was the same as the British Infantry Company was in the years before the war. Companies were grouped, usually eight companies, six or eight companies in the battalion and the battalions in the county regiments. Um, officer, UVF officers were appointed. They weren't supposed to use military titles uh, unless they had a military title from their own time in the army. The company commanders uh, were elected by their squad commanders. Lower level officers were also elected. Higher level officers a mixture of being elected and appointed by UVF headquarters. Um, it seems to be in a consensus from what a couple of references have seen that the company commanders and the half company commanders, with basically their two deputies, were considered to be officers in the sense of that an army officer is, and the lower level commanders were NCOs, non commissioned officers. Um, how far that distinction actually works in practice, I'm not altogether sure. In rural areas, generally officers commanding companies are being drawn from what would be said the natural leaders, the people who have always been given leadership in the unionist uh, Protestant community, land aristocracy, gentry, sometimes the clergy who become involved as well. Um, Belfast is more difficult because the social structure is different. So they're having to move into the commercial and into the middle class more. There are a number of volunteers from outside Ireland who can involved either from ideological reasons or because of being paid. You have people like Wilfred Spender, probably the best known man who gives up his commission uh, in the army to come and be work with the UVF. George Couchman, who is mentioned, who comes into Belfast to command the Belfast UVF, retired colonel on the army. He is probably being paid, as far as I know, uh, for this. You have other figures like Frank Crozier. Um, who had been uh, a British Army officer for four, being cashiered, he is definitely there for the money. Although he was, at that stage of his life, also ideologically committed to the Unionist cause. The Belfast Division claimed, 30, claimed to muster about 30,000 men. It's in four regiments based on the fourth Belfast parliamentary constituencies, north, south, east and west. South Belfast, we're interested in, was claiming a membership of 6,700 just before the war in six battalions of um, unequal size. And actually a seventh battalion had been formed at some stage um, as a sort of quick reaction special service unit, um, which was to be commanded by a guy called Walter McCready, will be, uh, which we'll be hearing about. Um, and as I say, bear in mind that the figures from the authorities were given the Royal Irish Constabulary would have been somewhat lower. People's commitment, people did sign up uh, for the UVF and didn't always turn out the parades all the time. Enthusiasm rose and fell. Um, after the gun running, you had a big increase of people uh, when weapons are going to be available. At moments of crisis, people are rushing to, to sign up. Not always going to be there when it was quieter. <clears throat> 
Also important to bear in mind, we do not have nominal roles. We don't have basically a nominal roles for the UVF anywhere. Records for Belfast are generally speaking worse than they are in rural areas. Uh, so you just cannot say whether a person, an individual was in the UVF or wasn't. They might claim to have been in the UVF. You might get other reports saying they're in the UVF. You cannot definitively say, you cannot come a list of people in the UVF. Do not have a list of officers uh, in the UVF. We do have the names of the more senior people involved because those turn up in various places, particularly amongst the um, UVF papers and the Austin Unionist Council papers in Peroni. There are various lists of people. They also turn up in newspapers. Every time there's a parade, it's, pre it's reported in great detail in the local newspapers. And officers are um, named, as you can see uh, on the list on the right hand side of the screen there for a newspaper account, uh, where it goes through and lists for a parade who was commanding the various units. There's also a fair amount of ephemera has survived. So you get these things like cask, um, pamphlet of a camp of instructions for the South Belfast Regiments, what doesn't give you names of who were some of the senior office, uh, senior people involved in that. Also, by the way, it, it does indicate that the UVF was training its officers. It was concerned to train the whole unit, but it was also particularly where they had to train the people who were giving leadership in it. Um, the 36th Division doesn't start forming until the first couple of weeks of September. Both the 36th and uh, 16th Division are fairly slow to get going, largely due to politics. Both the um, Unionists and Nationalists, although they offer full support for Britain in the war, uh, are looking to leverage their support to a certain extent and get some advantage from it. Unionists are particularly concerned by the fact that the uh, British government has passed the Home Rule Bill into law in August 1914, but suspended its operation. They're not at all happy with that, uh, and they feel there are going to be a problems again at the end of the war. Because of that, they, to a certain extent, see the UVF uh, or the, the Formation of the Division as an opportunity to get the UVF equipped and trained. So they are very keen for UVF officers and people associated with UVF to become officers in the 36th Division. Um, they draw up lists of the various regular um, militia, et cetera, officers who had been involved and ask them to be sent to the division. Happens in a few cases. Wolford Spender, for instance, who was an artillery officer, is sent back to the division uh, to work as a staff officer. Uh, Couchman, as I mentioned, uh, Couchman, Hackett Payne and Hickman, the three brigade, infantry brigade commanders in the division are all people who had been involved with the UVF. But quite a lot of the pre-war officers who'd been with the UVF don't come back to 36th Division. They serve with their own units, partly because of the strength of the regimental system in the British Army, that they, in most cases, would have wanted to be with their own regiment rather than with the 36th Division. And you have other figures like Crozier, who basically is goes to 36th Division largely because nobody else wants him. Uh, certainly his own regiment probably wouldn't have wanted him back. Um, but the, U, the UVF is also keen that the junior officers, the ones the volunteer officers who are going to be appointed, come from the UVF. And indeed, they pay the officer, they pay the wages of UVF officers who volunteer for service until such times they're commissioned and they're getting their wages from the government. So they're covering their wages uh, at a war office rates, and they also pay them a fitting off a, a fitting out allowance. So in September, recruitment begins on a large scale. The various UVF units parade through Belfast to the town hall where recruits sign on and are sent down to Donard Camp uh, just outside Newcastle. The um, south and west Belfast units end up in Donard Court, the north and east at Ballykindler. So Donard Court in September, you have a very large group of men who become who are formed the nucleus of 9th and 10th Battalion. Largely from the UVF, but not exclusively, because other people sort of heading down there once once recruitment gets going. There was also a group of people down there who were looking for commissions in the 9th and 10th battalions who were stuck together in a mess together. Um, um, 
Bob Wallace, uh, who Colonel Bob Wallace, who had commanded the South Down militia uh, in the years before the war, and particularly during the Boer War, is sent down there as camp as camp commandant uh, to supervise. Uh, he's a well-known figure in Unionist circles and in the Rings Order circles, so he's considered to have some authority to do that. Uh, and as I say, Couchman, early in September, is given command of the new brigade. It was interesting to note there are no battalion commanders, no colonels commanding battalions at this stage. They not appointed until October. So it's largely Couchman and the UVF officers who are down there. There's also a, a couple other uh, professional ex-army officers sent over there are but not many of them and there's a collection of non-commissioned officers who are sent over by the war office some of whom are also angling in to get commissions if they can so according to mccready's account he comes down there finds a large group of people a large group of officers or would-be officers sitting uh down at uh, donner camp by his account Couchman um, asks him and another UVF officer, Ernest May, to recommend the officers for the 10th Battalion. Ernest May had been second command of the South Belfast UVF. He'd served during the Boer War with the Imperial Yeomanry as a private soldier. Both McCready and May are in their early 30s, both, both 34, 35, so they're a bit older than most of the officers or the people looking for commissions which possibly gives them some authority. So on McCready's own account, he and May go through the officers there and make recommendations and she'll get commission. McCready's account is interesting because he appears to be, to a certain extent, influenced by cla class consciousness. McCready himself is from an upper middle class family. His father was a clergyman. Uh, he'd become a surgeon. He'd won the Trinity and Queens, quite an eminent surgeon in Belfast. He marries into the workman family, quite a well-known Belfast shipbuilding family. So he's from the, the upper ends of the Belfast commercial and professional classes. Um, he's particularly hostile to the non-commissioned officers who, are there who have aspirations to be officers. He feels it's not appropriate for them to become officers in the unit. And he's very much imbued with the idea that the officers are going to be gentlemen. So he mentions a couple of people that he finds there are a guy called Cunningham. He says, bolted the idea of a commission and a life in a mess of gentlemen and vanished. He found another guy called McCulloch down there who'd been drinking heavily for several days. He said on the third day, I paid him whatever the allowance was for UVF officers. And after a stern interview, sent him adrift. So he's being fairly selective and he's got down there. He mentions another guy, Thomas Parks, a man with 12 years service um, in, uh, in the ranks in, in the army. He'd re reached the rank, I think, of um, staff sergeant. A fine looking man, he said, slow and a bit stupid, especially where figures concerned, but having the respect of his men. According to uh, McCready, he had a heart to heart talk with him. And uh, Park had his whole soul in the thing, but he knew enough of the army to know he wasn't the stuff officers are made of. Besides feeling out of it at table, meaning in the mess, and when talking to us, he feared the expense. So I advised him to go to Belfast and list. And when he came back, I made him company sergeant major. Parks had quite an interesting career with the battalion. Um, we busted from company sergeant major uh, on these two occasions, court martial on a couple of occasions for drink offences. Um, quite an interesting character. But so we can see from that. Um, McCready has a firm idea of who he thinks should be officers. He wants them to be, what in his view, a gentleman. Uh, um, what he means by gentleman, we maybe look at later. And he's very much against recruiting people from the ranks at this stage. So I have put together a list, uh, or a database, as we now say, a spreadsheet of 24 officer, junior officers who are given commissions between September and December 1914 in the 10th Battalion. I've excluded some regular, there's two or three regular officers who come over generally at a, at a more senior level as captains or majors. I'm excluding the quartermasters because they are a sort of specialist grade. They are general, they were traditionally recruited from quartermaster sergeant majors. Um, I'm recruiting them, ignoring the more senior officers. And I did a short analysis of this group. 
So the basics on it is that the average age of these guys is 27. Two of them are under age. They're 17. The age for service was 19, but there's two of them are admitted under age, Trevor Bennett and Dolby Wallington. And there was one guy, Fred Gregg, who was 50, who was, was considered to be over the age for service. Those commissions were accepted. They were, they were, in spite of being not the proper age, their, their application was accepted. They're mainly unmarried. Only two of them I could find were actually married. They're nearly all from the business community, upper middle class business community. The only ones you would consider to be professionals, professional men are McCready, who's a surgeon, as I mentioned, and a guy called Barry Hill, who is a dentist. Um, and as I say, it can be difficult, you know, working with the information we have to sort of work out the status. But for instance, you have a guy called Stanley Stevenson. Now he puts himself down his application form as a warehouse man, which doesn't sound that impressive. But the warehouse he's working in is Joseph Stevenson and company, and his father is Joseph Stevenson. So, um, and he lives in Malone Park and plays cricket for Cliftonville. So it's pretty clear the class he's coming from. He is from the, the business owning class. He is the, you know, the son of the of the founder of the company. So even if he's that's that stage of his life working in the warehouse, he's meant for greater things. So most of them, judging by their addresses and their occupations, are from this class. There's no less than six out of the 24 living in Eglinton Avenue at this stage, and most of the rest are Malone Avenue uh, and that area around the Malone Road and Lisburn Road. There's a set of brothers, the Clinton brothers and the Walkingtons, uncle and nephew. There's a few who aren't from the upper classes or from the, so the upper business classes. There's a guy called Alfred Collings, who originally from Scarborough, who'd been living in Belfast for a number of years. He was a corporate salesman with Hannah and Brown in Belfast. Um, there's Sammy Galt, an interesting character. His father was a church missionary of the Shanker Road Mission. He lived in the Old Park Road, so I'm not altogether sure how he ended up in the South Belfast unit and played football for Cliftonville, uh, Captain Cliftonville's daughters, the second team. He was a clerk in a warehouse, so probably he's not, wouldn't be considered to be from the, the upper sense of society. There was also uh, um, Johnson Jordan, also done as a warehouse man, but in his case, his father was a compositor and he's living in Hard Class, Hardcastle Street, which is a fairly working class area, uh, street off the Armour Road. Uh, so probably not from the same class as well. They all get commissions. There's also Robert McLaren. Um, um, McCready does mention having some reservations about him. He described him as rustic. He was actually from Tyrone, one of 14 children of a Tyrone farmer. He had moved up to Belfast with some of his brothers, but they'd actually formed uh, McLaren Brothers Wholesale Food Merchants and were doing quite well. His brother, after the war, becomes a member of Belfast Corporation and uh, is actually ends up as high sheriff of Belfast. So they, an example, although McCready has some reservations about him, possibly based on his accent, he is actually a member of the Belfast business community um, and fairly well on and uh, doing quite well there. So not really as much of an outsider as some of the others might be. One dubious character that does get a commission is William Oswald. A uh, picture from there in later life when he was with the Ulster Special Constabulary. I've written at great and tedious length about uh, William Oswald. If you want to look it up, if you do a search, um, if you do a search under the uh, on the internet under that title, Gent "Temporary Gentleman," you may come across a copy of that article. But the Oswald is a dubious character. He um, son of an RIC sergeant. He had spent a few months in the army as a sixteen-year-old after running away from home. Spends four years in the RIC himself, then leaves on uncertain, not quite sure why, but possibly under a cloud. Not sure what he's working at in the years before the war. He claims to be a clerk in Belfast City Council. I'm pretty sure he wasn't. Uh, very nearly gets um, convicted for uh, assaulting and raping a woman in Belfast in 1913. Is put on trial, is acquitted, and was probably quite lucky to get acquitted. In my view, I haven't read the court proceedings. Um, McCready, I don't know how much McCready knew about his background or recent events, McCready disliked him intensely, 
um, described him uh, as a brute and unfit to command men. He seems to have been quite unpopular in the with the unit and with the other officers. And he is busted out of the battalion fairly quickly. He goes absent uh, without without leave over Christmas, first Christmas, 1916, uh, sorry, 1914, when he comes back, a search is made of his accommodation, which is found to be uh, overly endowed with empty whiskey and beer bottles. It then turned out he was bouncing checks in the sergeant's mess. So he is asked to leave. There's no formal proceedings against him, but basically he's prayed before the divisional commander and shouted at until such times as he agreed to resign. He goes on to have a fairly interesting career and managed to get himself commissioned a second time. But that's a story for another day, as I say. So he is the only real failure that I can see among that initial group. The group is interconnected in various ways. Um, they're connected by the UVF. I think most of them, I think, can be shown to be of some uh, involvement with the UVF. Not all necessarily as officers, but all seem to have been with it in some form or other. Connected through schools, seven of them were at Inst, six of them were at Methody. Uh, none at Campbell, interestingly enough. Um, and they're in, connected through sport. Um, there are no less than two Irish internationals in the battalion. Lewis Stewart, who played for North, um, had two caps for Ireland. Um, he was to be killed. He later moved from the battalion to the machine gun battalion and then in the machine gun corps and is killed in October 1917. Norman McClinton, uh, who played for Malone, also got two caps in 1910. He also toured South Africa with the British Lions. Um, so on this day, quite a, quite a well-known player. And he's also, by the way, the son of another Irish international, Dolway um, Wellington, who's with the battalion, is the son of a Dolway Wellington who actually capped in Ireland in the previous generation. So a lot of rugby players, at least four of them in that initial group, played for North and four of them for Malone. And the rugby connection is quite important for the UVF. Um, North, um, one of the senior rugby clubs in, in Ulster, they actually suspended all of their fixtures in, in early January 1914. Specifically, it was said so that members of the club could drill with the UVF. Other cl clubs in the North Fodum, including Malone, by February 1914, all senior rugby in the North had stopped. So rugby was seen as a recruiting ground for the UVF, as well as for the Ulster Division. They're also connected through church as, as well, as you would expect. All of them that I, in that group are the Church of Ireland, Presbyterian or Methodists. And there's groups of them connected with St. Thomas's uh, Church of Ireland on Lisburn Road and University Road Methodist Church. What they don't have, it's interesting to note at this stage, is previous military service. Uh, I mentioned McCready had he'd been four years in the Queen's Officer Training Corps, held his commission in the Officer Training Corps, and had commanded the, the Queen's OTC for two years and had his proficiency uh, certificates. So he has the most experience. Ernest May had been in the Imperial Yeomanry for a few months during the Boer War as a private soldier. Oswald had six months in the army, as I mentioned, as a um, underage soldier, and then four years in the RIC, Royal Irish Constabulary, which would have given him some basic military training. He'd have been tra trained in drill, he'd been trained in firearms in the RIC, but not actually military training as such. And Collings, the guy was, that had been in England, apparently spent a few months in the territorials while in England. And that is it, none of the rest of them had any military experience. Their military performance as a group, uh, in brief, seems to have been fairly reasonable. Five of them end up being killed in action, five out of the 24 during the course of the war. Five of them win the military cross, four of them win the DSO. One of them, uh, Hamilton Glendinning, who goes on as a recruit this stage, becomes a battalion commander, lieutenant colonel. Several of the others end up as majors and captains, and a number of them are given regular commissions commissions in the regular army and a couple of them stay on after 1920 with the army. Um, having said that, others moved out fairly quickly out of the 10th Battalion. I mentioned Oswald being kicked out. 
A 17th Battalion and four reserve battalions are formed uh, in October or November 1914. The 17th Battalion is formed to supply recruits to the Belfast Brigade units. And uh, some of the officers, three officers, are moved out, including one of the underage guys, to that 17th Battalion where they presume to get more training. Fred Gregg, the guy was 50, he's kicked out in May 1916 when they get to France as unfit due to age. Uh, though he stays in France commanding prisoner of war units. McCready himself moves out. He was sent to the Army Medical Corps. He was a trained surgeon and was needed as a surgeon. Louis Stewart, I mentioned, goes to the Machine Gun Corps. Others get wounded or sick and some of them transfers to other battalions. So there is, from early days, there is a churn, there is a turnover of officers. I also looked at a second group of officers who get commissions between, during 1915 and 19, 1916 up until the Battle of the Somme. There are uh, 26 in the group that I, that I identified in the database. Very rough analysis of this. Um, I've ignored people like quartermasters, senior officers coming in. Limited uh, information, some of them, as I said, because of the lack of files. But of those 26, seven of them are actually from Belfast. We're living in Belfast at the time of enlistment. Five are from other parts of Ulster, three from the rest of Ireland. Only eight, I would designate it English, which includes people, when I say English, includes people who might have been born in the colonies, Burma or whatever, but her English birth. And interestingly enough, as we'll see more later, three Canadians who are actually English people who joined up in Canada. Um, the early... Officers who are commissioned are commissioned directly into the battalion. They're given no protective training. They they tr get their training with their men, with the battalion. They're not given any special training as officers. From 1915, various schemes put forward to actually give um, some measure of officer training um, for new recruits. So the Queen's Officer Training uh, Unit becomes a sort of training unit for officers getting commissions. So people go into the Queen's OTC for a period, then they go to the 17th Battalion and they're deployed from the 17th Battalion. Uh, so there's a new system in, in place. Um, I just mentioned there's still people coming in to the battalion, you know, who are from Belfast. One example who would that be would be George York Henderson. He had actually been commissioned uh, initially into the Army Service Corps in November 1916 and become a captain in the Army Service Corps. This was the divisional train with the 36th Division. However, he reverts the second lieutenant in March 1916 in order to join the 10th Battalion as an infantry officer. Fights in the Battle of the Somme and killed in action in 1917. He's a very similar profile to the, to the guys that joined up in September and October 1914, educated in Method A. He's the son of Sir James Henderson, the owner of the newsletter. He lives in Windsor Park uh, as well. So he's very similar profile to the guys that were already there. So say there are other ways of recruiting officers coming into the army at this stage. So you have, for instance, the train, the ends of court regiment, which was an English territorial regiment, which is turned into an officer training unit. And during the course of the war, trains about 12,000 officers. So you have three officers come into the battalion um, in 1915 through the ends of court. They're all Londoners, all from London, um, and include actually, by way of passing, a guy called John Crockett, who was the football correspondent of the Daily Mail. Um, so these guys with no real connection to Ireland at all. Um, there's also a very large influx of officers in May and June 1916, either nine or 10, the dates are a bit um, uncertainly. So in the run up to the Battle of the Somme, there's a big influx of officers, four of whom come from 6th Battalion, the Royal Irish Rifles. The 6th had been raised as part of the 10th Division and had been sent out. These officers, as far as I can make out, had been officers who had served with the 10th or with the 10th Division, had been through Gallipoli and had been sent back wounded or sick. Uh, and instead of being sent back to the 10th uh, division, which after Gallipoli was sent to Salonika, where they stayed for several years, which was sort of the backwater, had been held back in Ireland and then are sent to the 36th division. 
which is an interesting factor. So you have at least four going to the 10th Battalion in June 1916 from that background. I'll mention briefly, there's a few sort of odds and sods and strays also make the way into the battalion. A guy called David Reed, uh, for instance, turns up. He's 40 years old. He's the owner of tea and, and rubber plantations in, in Malaya. Uh, quite wealthy, a married man with two children living in Seven Oaks in Kent. He turns up as a lieutenant with the 10th Division, uh, well, sorry, with, with, the, with the 10th Battalion. Not quite sure why. He's not a guy who would have needed to volunteer um, as a family man and somebody with for a bit of money. He, would have, um, he was involved in service politics very heavy during the war. I suspect he has a sentimental attachment to the Unionist cause and it is why he decided he wanted to, to serve with the Ulster Volunteers. And his, his obituary in the local paper in 1940 talks about him that he served with the Ulster Volunteers years during the war. So obviously that was sentiment on his count that got him to volunteer uh, for the 36th Division. He doesn't ask very long with the battalion at that age he ends up in the Army Service Corps. Another exotic, if you like, is a, there's a Captain Griffiths. Griffiths was an English probably schoolboy, um, went to Bedford's school, served with the Cape Mounted Rangers in South Africa. He then emigrates to America joins the American army as a private, works his way up as an officer, serves in the Philippine campaign, the American invasion of the Philippine Islands, um, becomes an American citizen and joins a force called the Philippine, Philippine Islands Constabulary, which is a paramilitary set up, force set up by the Americans uh, after they taken over the Philippine Islands to run it. And he ends up um, eventually as Colonel and Assistant Chief of the, of the, Palantai, of the Philippine Philippine Consabre by July 1914, at which case he leases and comes back to Britain and in this again as an officer. He's actually enlisted directly as a captain and also sent the 10th to 10th Royal Irish. Um, he's wounded actually um, fairly soon after his arrival in the battalion, very badly wounded, discharged from the army again in 1917 and dies in England in 1919. So again, an interesting story, um, but just an example of how diverse at this stage of the war, the sort of diaspora that is coming back to actually join the army. And you do get these sort of strays and unconnected people uh, joining the battalion. I mentioned the three Canadians. Um, curious thing about these three guys is they all die on the 1st of July. Uh, there are only three Canadians, as far as I know, that got commissions and they all die on the 1st of July. Um, Morris Adamson, English probably schoolboy at ALB College, uh, actually born in Burma. His father was an Indian civil servant. He goes, emigrates to Canada um, and joins the Canadian Army there, comes back to Britain with the Canadians, is commissioned in January 1915 from the Canadians and sent the 10th Battalion. Um, he applies for a regular commission, which given his background isn't particularly surprising. And he's actually listed and come with War Graves Commission website as being with the Royal Scots Fusiliers, though he is actually with 10th Battalion when he's killed in the Battle of the Somme. But obviously he was probably going to Royal Scots Fusiliers at some stage. The other two are interesting. It's quite an interesting photograph of them there. Um, uh, Fred Mastermind and Bill Dean. Um, Masterman was an old English public school boy. Um, Dean was from a sort of lower middle class family. They both emigrated to Alberta and they were both living and working on a ranches in a place called Lundbrek, Alberta, which took a lot of looking up and a lot of Googling. It was a town of about 400 people then, it's, it's much bigger now. Uh, they again signed up to the Canadian Cavalry at, at the start of the war, the 13th Canadian Mounted Rifles which is a unit which still exists, believe it or not, it's now called the South Alberta Light Horse. So that is a photograph I managed to find on a Canadian website of the two of them with the Canadian Cavalry uh, at, some, uh, at some stage. It's, it's a bit of a mystery how they end up. What I think happened is that Mastermind has relatives in Dublin. He seems to have gone to Dublin at the, in Christmas 1915, then wandered down to the 3rd Battalion Royal Irish Rifles uh, Depot, which was in Dublin at that stage, and managed to talk himself into commission, him and Dean. So they're both commissioned in February 1916 and sent to 10th Battalion, as I say, killed during the war.
Um, I mentioned Crozier's talk about, you know, um, Dodd's um, nice picture of Crozier, by the way, this is him in later life when he is posing as a, an author, a peace campaigner and a philosopher. Um, I mentioned, I, I, I did assert to see as anybody that could be given that man without being overly judgmental. I mentioned Oswald, who was obviously a man unsuited for a commission, but it was found out pretty early. Other figures that he might have had in mind or if he came across them was a guy called Otto Martin. He commissioned into the 10th in October 1914, had been sent to the 17th Battalion in, in June 15 when the rest of the battalion um, went over to France. In June 16, he sent the France, but he, he sent the West Belfast Battalion, uh, 9th Royal Irish Rifles. Um, he is then, uh, something happens during the first day of the Somme campaign. Um, according to reports, he was seen wandering around uh, in rear areas, did not join in the, the attack with the rest of his men. He claimed himself uh, to be shell-shocked, and, and actually a report was sent to his family immediately after the battle saying that he'd been killed. Well, finally, he wasn't, but he, he appears to have been close to a shell explosion and was shocked. He is required to resign his commission. He's not court-martialed. He is required to sign his commission. He himself, now we don't know much about the case because there isn't his, his, his full officer file isn't there and there's only a very brief file which deals with some of the controversy and doesn't give full details of what happened. But um, he blamed Crozier, who he claimed had, had a dislike to him uh, for the complaints against him. It's interesting that Crozier, who especially in his book, takes a very hard line on people and had tried to get another officer in his battalion court-martialed and actually wanted to get him executed, he claimed, for not taking part in an attack. But Crozier actually just recommended that this guy be sent back to the 10th, uh, the 17th time. He said he was not fit to command in the fields because of nervousness, but could be used to train men. And Nugent, as the division commander, agrees with his assessment. However, the army, when it goes to the length of the army council, they say should be he leave the army. So he's forced to resign. He's not court martialed as such, but he is forced to resign his commission. So it's interesting, it shows Crozier in a somewhat different light uh, from that, he's, that he portrays himself not taking a particularly hard line with this guy, or not hard line as he should, but he may have been somebody he may have in mind when he's putting these censures about local officers. There was a guy called George King who was with an officer battalion commissioned in May 1915 who was court-martialed and dismissed as an officer in May 1916. I know absolutely nothing about him. I can't find an, I can't find an officer file and I haven't been able as yet to find a court martial record. So I don't even know if he was a local officer or what the background is. And just, and there's another officer who was an example of somebody who doesn't really shine during his career. I'm not gonna give you his name just in case any of his family are in the chat, uh, but he was from Derry originally working in Belfast Commissioned in uh, 17th Royal Irish uh, in uh, 1915, sent the 10th Royal Irish in France in 2nd of June 1916, posted 2nd of 23rd of June 1916, and doesn't see any active officers after that. During the rest of his army career, he is treated for appendicitis, hernia, syphilis, and gonorrhea, the syphilis and gonorrhea being separate accounts was to suggest a man who doesn't have any great ability to learn from his mistakes. He's court-martialed twice um, for drunkenness and for being absent without leave. He turned up for one of his medical examinations drunk. He, in both cases, he's treated fairly leniently. He, he, he lost seniority. He's still in the army, believe it or not, in May 1919 in the 3rd Battalion, and he applies for posting as a staff officer, somewhat optimistically. His assessment at that stage from this commanding officer was a very bad type of officer. He's an exceedingly bad example in all respects. This to me shows that you should never ask for feedback from a staff appraisal because uh, you never know what you're going to get. But um, he's actually chucked out of the army after, shortly after that. Uh, re enlisted in the army as a private, chucked out again as a private in 1924. And I've reason to believe um, his name turns up in the civil service several years later but it's a story for another day.
Um, he is obviously a bit of a waste of space, it has to be said. He's quite curious, actually, that the army just sort of kept him on, even though the guy had seen no service and is basically, it appears, hanging around being sick for three years. But you will always get people like that in any organisation. Those, having said, are the only ones that strike out to me as being obvious duds not, um, from that. There's other guys that are moved out of the battalion uh, into the 70s battalion who go to other units. But there doesn't seem to be any evidence of any great move to move people out of the unit. Battle of the Somme, very briefly, the battalion takes very heavy casualties. Um, particularly heavy officer casualties. Um, there's a total of 20 officer casualties, 10 killed, uh, 10 wounded during during the battle. Um, it should be said, under the outer battle system that was set up for the Battle of the Somme, um, there was only supposed to be 20 officers with each battalion. A selection of officers were held back. The, um, Nugent, commanded the division, wanted the um, battalion commanding officers to stay out of the of the attack, but Bernard and 10th and, you need to say, Crozier and the 9th both went forward with their battalions. Uh, Crozier, or Bernard, is killed. Um, so he's one of the 20 officers, uh, one of the 10 officers killed, uh, along with another nine junior officers. Um, by the end of the day, it said there's only one officer still on his feet, still actually serving, who is Trevor Bennett, who was probably under, still under age at that stage. He was 17 when he signed up, so he might have been just about 19. So he's the only officer surviving and is actually commanding what's left of the battalion in the later part of the 1st of, of July. Um, those are the officers who are killed, to say. Four of them are English, six of them are local Ulster officers. Um, I won't go through, we're running out of time, I see, um, coming up to eight o'clock and I've gone on long enough, but uh, point to make of these, most of them are Ulster officers uh, from the north of Ireland. Corbett, for instance, they're uh, one of the guys, another Belfast man, he had joined the battalion later on um, via the public schools. He was a public school boy. Um, he was, father was the owner of, uh, I think it was Brown and Corbett, the whiskey distillery. Went into the public schools battalion, was his battalion raised in public school boys at the start of for the Royal Fusil years, at the start of the war. But then is commissioned in back into the Royal Army, into the 36th Division and ends up in the 10th Battalion. He's also from South Belfast, also goes um, to St. Thomas's Church, also plays rugby for, for North, so very much the same type of person that is signing up in 1914. Um, the other ones as well are either local or North of Ireland people. Um, Green um, was imported down. He'd come in, um, his father's a flower merchant. He'd come in via the Trinity Cottage OC, uh, OCT, another rugby and, and football player. Um, Bagnall uh, had actually been another UVF guy, but in East Belfast, commissioned into the East, Bel East Belfast and then transfers into as, as Eighth Royal Irish and then transfers into Tenth Royal Irish. Um, and um, Wilson um, is the son of a Methodist minister from... So he'd lived in various places around the north of Ireland. Um, and Craig uh, was from Uri. His father was a grocer in, in, in Uri, commissioned in November 1915. So point making from that is, in spite of the fact you have this sort of cluster of sort of English officers, and there was a group of officers being moved into the battalion fairly later on, and it's an interesting fact, I don't know if anybody's actually looked at, is that the battalion, um, when it's going into um, the um, into the attack on 1st of July 1916, has got a firm number of officers who have only, junior officers who had not long been with the battalion, um, who had only been a few, a few weeks. We usually assume that it's the group of officers who trained with them from the start to go through. It's not, there is a turnover. But it's by no means a question, quest that it, it, this was a group of English, junior English officers being brought in. Most of the officers who are there on that day 
are from Belfast or from the north of Ireland uh, that are take part in the account. And just in closing, um, sorry, that's photographs are to show now a few of the of the local men, Corbett, Elliot, and Wilson. Also interesting to note that in July 1916, there was 18 replacement officers in that month joined the battalion. They all come from Irish regiments. So as yet, we're not seeing any of the sign of the dilution of the, having to fill up the unit necessarily with from English regiments. Now, the fact that they're from Irish regiments doesn't mean that they're necessarily Irish or born out there in the Ireland, but they are all coming, those officers are all coming from Irish regiments, though a lot of them are coming from the Royal Irish Regiment, and I suspect may be originally 10th uh, Division officers. And just briefly, going back to Nugent's criticism of why he thought the officers were the wrong class, they weren't from the landed class, they weren't from landed families, they are from the commercial middle class, which was probably not what he had in mind when he thought about an officer class. Um, Nugent is a very traditional, he's from a land earning family in County Cavan, a fairly traditional officer, very traditional view on the army, um, expected officers to be from that background. It was a criticism made by Spender, among others, that though when he had very qualities, he didn't understand the proper ways of actually commanding volunteers and particularly giving the background. Nugent also did not like the Belfast commercial classes. He had a lot of run-ins with unionism in Belfast. He was a unionist himself, but an Irish unionism uh, based on the idea of keeping the whole of Ireland into the union in some form or other. He was not in favour of partition, and he was of the view, quite correctly, as it turned out, that in the end of the day, Belfast-based unionism wouldn't support Calvin unionists in the end of the day and uh, would leave them if partition came, quite correctly. So he had a lot of sort of baggage with the Belfast, what he called Belfast unionism, which is largely dominated by the commercial and industrial unionism in Belfast. That could be partly the background towards his hostility towards a group of officers who don't, on the face of it, look that different from the sort of people who had been getting commissions uh, in the LR, New Army Battalion at that stage. So I can see, I think I've gone on um, long enough here. So I will stop the sharing and open it for questions. And uh, there are people in the chat that's better qualified than me to comment on this, and hopefully they will come in and make some comment on this. So, as I say, now leave it open for questions. <laughs>